Good morning, church. Let's stand up and sing together. Do you believe God's doing something great right here? Right here in this church. Come on, we sing it. There is no place that I'd rather be right now. Jesus, you are who we're here for. Lift his name up in this house so I can feel it. I believe it. I can hear it. I can see it. Yes, our God, he's on the move. Amen. Come on. I believe in the promise of his presence. Jesus, you are. to sing about God being on the move, but not only do we get to sing about it, but we get to see it in our church every single week. Aren't y'all thankful for that, to see that God is on the move? Man, that's so amazing. Hey, I know that maybe some of us show up week after week and we're like, man, I I would love to be a part of what God is doing here at OBC, but it's a large place. There's a lot of people. How do I take my next steps? What do I do, man? You're going to hear things like OBC 101 and vision class and baptism and groups and serving and ah, what do I do? All you have to know is this. Every Sunday during both services, there is a really small, intimate, laid-back conversation going on called Next Steps. It's in the main building, in the lobby, in room L1. All you got to do is show up there and go, here's why I'm here. And we're going to help you facilitate whatever it is God's doing as he is moving you to the next thing. But maybe you don't sit here week after week. Maybe it's your very 
first time. What should they do? Hey, if this is your first time hanging out with us, let us be the first, hopefully not the first, but if so, (laughs) maybe we are the first to say that we're glad that you're here, that you're checking things out, whether you're online or you're here in person. We would love to be able to connect with you, and the easiest way for us to do that is if you'll just take out your phones and text the word guest to the number on the screen. One of our pastors on staff will reach out to you, and then also we're going to send you a free digital gift just for hanging out with us today, something free. You'll love it. We're not going to sell your, any of your information to anybody to spam you. We promise. There are a couple ways that you can engage in worship today that sometimes you might not think of when you just think about going to worship on Sunday. The first is through our prayer ministry. Man, we are always, always very serious about praying for one another. And so maybe you're here today and you have a prayer request or you want somebody to pray with you today. Back in the corner of the student ministry building, you'll see the purple prayer flag right next to the prayer closet. And uh, you can fill out and uh, <laughs> uh, movie reference. Sorry, I didn't get it. Um, you can fill out a prayer request right there. If you'd like somebody from our prayer team to pray with you, they can do that as well. Um, you can always fill out a prayer request on our website or our mobile app 24-7. And you can also engage in worship today by giving. Uh, we have all been impacted by the faithful, generous, consistent giving of so many people for years and years and years as being a part of this church body. And that we know that's an important part of your worship. So you can do that at the giving kiosks that are here or in the main building. Uh, maybe you're watching on Line. You can give any time uh, through our mobile app or through our website. And if you're a check writer or a cash giver, there will be ushers at the door with baskets no matter uh, where you're leaving from. You can drop those in there as well. And man, if you're praying, you need to be praying for what's coming up next couple weeks, right? Next weekend, we have our high school weekend. We've been talking about it. We're super excited about seeing students take their next steps in Jesus, with Jesus. And so please, 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 if you couldn't volunteer, maybe the, the, best, the best thing that you actually could do is to pray for our high schoolers next weekend as they come in. And maybe you're here and you're like, I ain't got a high schooler, but I got a middle schooler. Well, good news is our middle school weekend is the week after that. And today is the last day to register for our middle school weekend. So if you have not done that, make sure to go home and and fill out that registration form or to text several friends and say, hey, come with me to the middle school weekend, right? That's right. Hey, Hey, stand up, find somebody around you, give them a high five and tell them good morning. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem and crown.
tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Amen. There's nothing like the grace and the love of the Lord. Amen. No matter what you came in with today, God in his grace and his mercy and his goodness affords you this opportunity to meet with him right here, right now. Confess your sins all to Jesus. Come on. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. You know what I like? Come on. Over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus
Everybody okay today? Y'all are looking good. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for joining us online. Um, how would you answer this question? I am. How would you answer that question? You, you see, the answer to that question to a very large degree drives our lives, decides our eternity, and determines our identity. We're continually tempted to embrace a false identity. I am something that we're really not. We're continually tempted to embrace a false identity. Then we believe a lie that our false identity gives us value. I am the way I appear. I have value because I'm cute, because I'm ripped, because I'm tatted up, because I'm sexy. I am what I do. I have value because I'm a doctor, because I'm a business owner, because I'm a pastor. I am what other people say I am. I have value because other people like me and accept me. I am what I have. I have value because I have money and stuff. Mm. What defines who you are? I'm rich, I'm poor, I'm young, I'm old, I'm white, I'm Hispanic, I'm African American, I'm gay, I'm straight, I'm trans, I'm smart, I'm stupid, I'm loved, I'm hated, I'm single, I'm married, I'm divorced, I'm desirable, I'm undesirable, I'm successful, I'm a failure. How do you define 
yourself. What is your identity? You see, mainstream pop psychology talks a lot about self-esteem, self-image, self-worth. There, there are countless ideas and mountains of books, endless effort to build our self-esteem, our self-image, our self-worth. But Jesus really has a very different plan. Jesus doesn't want to build our self-esteem, our self-image, our self-worth. Jesus wants to destroy them and replace them with something much better. God wants to give us God esteem, God image, God worth. You see, we also have an enemy who wants to steal our true identity and replace it with a lie. You know, um, the Bible just makes things black and white, very simple. You know, God has a very simple and clear idea about our identity. See how very much our Father loves us, for He calls us His children, and that is what we are. That's pretty clear, isn't it? I'm not what other people say I am, cute, stupid, weird, addict. I'm not what I do, lawyer, mechanic, teacher. I'm not what's been done to me, abused, abandoned. I'm not what I do, I'm not, what, I'm not what's been done to me. I am God's child because of what Jesus did for me. In our study of Colossians, we've made it to chapter 3. Uh, I've called this study Standing Strong in an Age of Deception. And one of Satan's greatest deceptions is confusing us about who we are, our, our identity. You see, we find our identity in Jesus. Question. How can I really know where I find my identity? Well, I'm glad you asked. Today, we're going to take an identity test. Colossians 3 gives us some crystal clear criteria to determine if we are living our identity in Jesus. So we're going to have an identity test. Uh, am I living my identity in, in Jesus? And this uh, first part of chapter 3 in Colossians asks us five questions. Ready? Here's the first one. Test question number one. Is my focus heaven? Colossians 1, Colossians 3, 1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden in Christ with God. Now, now look at this, verse 4. And when Christ, who is your life, I mean, there's our identity. When Christ, who is your life, and when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. I mean, you get that, right? When Jesus comes back. And he is coming back. The whole world will see the reality of his glory. And on that day, there's only going to be two identities. You're either a child of God or you're not. You're either going to spend eternity in heaven and reveal and get the reality of his glory. Or you're going to spend eternity in hell in the reality of his wrath. For the most part, for the most part, when people think about heaven, it's when there's a death, it's when there is suffering, it's when our life is blown up, right? I mean, God, today would be a great day for you to come back. Everything's a disaster, right? Or somebody dies, or we're suffering. Now, I need to give a little disclaimer here. Um, 
Uh, I'm not saying we should just sit around thinking about heaven all day. You know, there's an old cliche, you know, um, we can be so heavenly minded, we're of no earthly good. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. You know people like that. I know people like that. So what this means is we should see everything through the lens of heaven. In other words, when things come up in life, when there's death, you see death through the lens of heaven because death doesn't win, right? Uh, For a believer, man, death doesn't win. Jesus conquered death when there's suffering. We see the suffering through the lens of heaven. You know, there's a place where there's not going to be any more suffering. This is all temporary. (laughs) <laughs> this, this, this isn't what eternity is going to be like. This, this is just a little bitty space of time. And there's suffering and there's heartache and there's sin and there's death here. But there's a place where there's not. So we see it through the lens of that. When, when, you, you ever feel like you don't fit in? Anybody ever feel like that? Like, man, you, know, you see that through the lens of heaven. You know why? This isn't my home. I'm just kind of passing through here. But I have a home, and my home's in glory. Hmm. Here's a good question to ask yourself. Are you ever homesick for heaven? Phil Wickham uh, sings a song. It's called The Hymn of Heaven. The first line of the song just captures me every time I hear it. Here's what it says. How I long to breathe the air of heaven. Do you? Ever? You see, when our identity is, I'm a child of God, we should want to be where our Father is. Right? Do you ever have those moments? Do you ever have those moments? Where you're overjoyed or when you're really hurting and you just get alone with God and God just where he comforts our worries when he brings peace to our pain when he fills our hearts with joy you have those moments? That's just a glimpse of heaven. Hmm. Don't you want that all the time? Forever? Yeah. Listen. If the identity we claim and the desire of our heart don't match up. Something's wrong. You know, there are uh, real practical reasons to think about heaven instead of the things of the earth. Here's some. Focusing on heaven reminds me who I really am and where my home really is. You see, I'm not a citizen of this place. I mean, I live in North Carolina in the United States of America, and I love them both. I'm a citizen of planet Earth, but none of those things are my home. Heaven's my home, and I really am a child of God, a citizen of heaven. My purpose on Earth will matter forever. You, you, You see, when we live out our purpose on Earth that God intends for us, It's not just something that ends when we take our last breath here. We are storing up our treasure in heaven. We are living out God's purpose for our life. And we won't even know all that that means until we get to heaven when we're faithful at it and see every way God used us we didn't even know about. Just because we desired to fulfill his purpose for our life. How about this? The junk of this world is temporary. I mean, when I focus on heaven, man, I remember the junk of this world is not going to last In fact, could you imagine if we didn't have any hope beyond the junk? Could you imagine if we didn't have any hope behind, uh, past the death, past the suffering? 
Mm, how about this? Uh, the things that bring me ridicule now will bring me reward in eternity. The things that people think are ridiculous and stupid and waste of time now, not in heaven. Am I living my identity in Jesus? Test question number two. Do I regularly die to my sin nature? Colossians 3, 5. Put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Stop right there a second. Wow, what a, what a powerful image. But put to death the sinful things that are lurking in you. I mean, they're hiding. Waiting. Do it. Nobody will know. Come on. It's going to be great. Come on, you. Come on. Look at it. Man, it's going to be so good. Bam! Owns you. Right like that. It's lurking. Hiding, sucking you in, then it owns you. Mm. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you and have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Do you guys agree with this? We live in a very sensual world. Do you guys agree with that? I mean, almost on every level from the time little kid i mean people want to sensualize and sexualize little kids man it's all over the place and it's like that all the way through till till we go to heaven we're going to struggle with this we're going to it's going to be in our face we live in a very sensual world and it appeals to the sinful desires lurking in us and if we don't kill them dead they alone us put to death the sinful earthly desires, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and the evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. So sometimes the sinful stuff lurking in us is sensual. Sometimes it's material. You know, two things the Bible says we're supposed to flee from. The love of money and sexual sin. So when it comes to money and honeys, head for the hills. <laughs> it's so easy. It, it is really so easy to find our identity in what we desire and what we have. Or to believe what I have gives me value. Value. When we are greedy, we desire stuff. The stuff we desire ultimately become an idol that we worship. So maybe you're thinking right now, uh, I have stuff. I have money, but I don't worship it. Is it possible to have and enjoy nice stuff, have money, without worshiping it? Absolutely. I mean, the Bible's full of really rich people who honored God with everything they had. So how do I know? How do I know if I'm worshiping, making an idol out of stuff? Well, just ask yourself a question. Do I give the stuff in my life greater value than I give obedience to God? I have a lake house. I have a mountain home. I have a boat. I have an RV. Worked hard to get them. Now I'm disobeying God by being out of church way more often than I should to enjoy my stuff. I want stuff so much because it looks like that gives me value. It makes me feel like I have value that I go way in debt to get it. Now I can't 
obey God in giving what he asked me to give. And I'm not even going to get into all the kids' activities we worship and give greater value to than obeying God. That, that's a whole nother sermon series. Do I give the stuff in my life greater value than I give obeying God? Verse 6. Because of these sins, sexual sin and loving stuff, the anger of God is coming. Well, let that sink in a minute. Verse 7. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world. Implication, if you say you're a believer but you're still doing these things, time for some hard questions. Verse 8. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. I want to kind of hit this a minute. It says, um, get rid of dirty language. Now, that's not just F-bombs and sex talk. It means any language that makes you sound like you don't belong to Jesus. Where the blank are they? Well, blank. Blanket. <laughs> I ain't going to fill in the blank because y'all know them. I've heard some of y'all say them. <laughs> Matthew said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whoa, boy, that's convicting, isn't it? Paul said it in even more clear terms to the church at Ephesus. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. So when it comes to dying to our sin nature, probably the best indicator is what comes out of your mouth. Mm. Maybe right now you're thinking, well, now wait a minute. Just because I let a few cuss words fly occasionally, that doesn't mean I don't belong to Jesus. I agree. That's not the issue. The issue is, does the way you talk convince other people you belong to Jesus? Are you dying to your sinful nature and living for Jesus? Look at Romans 6, verse 11. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. All right. Am I living my identity in Jesus? Test question number three. Is my desire to be more like God? Colossians 3.10. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, uh, barbaric, uh, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. All of us who are his children who have believed. This is an undeniable truth. The more you desire God, the more you will be like God. So take a little quick heart check. 
Do you desire to know God and be more like Him? It's a simple question. Do you desire to know God more and be more like Him? It doesn't require a lot of information. It just requires a lot of honesty. Maybe you're thinking, though, well, I kind of want to, but I can't say that that's true most of the time. So how do I give God more of my desires how do I have desires that make me want to be more like God? Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desire of your heart. Now, that doesn't mean when you delight yourself in the Lord, He gives you whatever you want, whatever your heart desires. Here's what it means. When you delight yourself in the Lord, He's going to give you the right desires. So, the more I seek God, the more I live for God, the more I want to know God, the more I'm in the Word, the more I'm on my knees, the more I'm fellowshipping with believers, the more I'm checking my lifestyle, the more I'm checking my language, the more I delight myself in God with my behavior, God then increases my desire for more of Him. Then when I have the desire for more of Him, it, incre- it just increases my behavior to want more of Him. And then it's this cycle that just says, man... God is my desire, and I want to be like him. Am I living my identity in Jesus? Test question number four. Do I treat other people with the love and forgiveness of Jesus? Boy, this is huge. This is probably the greatest test of whether or not our identity is in Jesus. Colossians 3.12 Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself. That just means this is what people see when they see me. If I'm clothed in something, this is what they see when they see me. So since God chose you to be his holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Is that what people see when they see you? Let's look at that list again. Clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. So when you think, man, I'll tell you, that person, they deserve for me to give them peace of my mind that you usually can't afford to give away. But instead... You give them tender-hearted mercy. Whoa, that's a powerful statement, isn't it? Not only that, but kindness. The people say, that's a kind person. Humility. Gentleness and patience. You guys are getting this, right? Who does who's that sound like? Tender heart of mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Sound like Jesus, doesn't it? So when people see you, do they see your clothed in those things? Is that what they see? Verse 13. Make allowance. For each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. That's huge. 
how do you respond to someone else's faults? Make allowances for each other's faults. Anybody here not have any faults? Right. We all got them, right? So we get to decide. When, when somebody else's faults land on me, whether it's a spouse, it's your kids, it's your parents, somebody you work with, somebody at the grocery store. I mean, when somebody else's faults land on me, what am I going to do with that? See, most of us feel very entitled when somebody else's faults land on us. And I feel justified in doing that. But when our, when our identity is in Jesus, it should be something different. We don't clothe ourselves in, I'm entitled and justified. We clothe ourselves in the things that look like Jesus, making faults, making allowance for each other's faults. What do you do? What do you do with someone else's faults? Those things that irritate and sometimes hurt you. Do you respond with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience? Or... And forgiving, just as Christ forgave you? Or do you put conditions on forgiving someone else? So, everybody's got faults. Sometimes their faults land on you. When those things land on you, do you act like Jesus, clothe yourself in the things that look like Jesus... Or is it... Anger, bitterness. So this is really clear. When somebody else's faults land on us, the proper response is forgiveness. <sighs> I'm going to tell you, man, this is something I've struggled with a lot in my life. Can I forgive you without you acknowledging how much you hurt me. You, you see, that's a trap. When we feel entitled and justified when somebody's faults land on us and we think, I don't have to forgive them until they acknowledge what they did to me and how much they hurt me. And I'm totally justified, totally entitled to hold on to that until they make an acknowledgement to me. I don't want to get into a lot of Greek stuff here, but the way this is worded in the Greek text basically means whoever is aware of this tension is the one that needs to forgive. Even if they don't even know, you got to forgive. Because there's a trap. You see, if I'm going to live in when somebody's stuff lands on me, I'm not going to forgive them. Until they acknowledge how much they've hurt me. You know what's going to happen? If they acknowledge it, I'm going to go, okay. You now deserve my forgiveness. But then you know what we're doing? We're watching. We're listening. Then it happens again. 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 So we get in this cycle. We get in this trap of unforgiveness. And it makes us bitter. We have such clear instruction here that we forgive not because they deserve it, not because they acknowledged it. We forgive them because Jesus forgave us, period, unconditional. I don't know how many, more than I can count. I've had people sitting in my office and I'll say, you need to forgive them. Now, I have forgiven them. You need to forgive them. I have forgiven them. I can tell. <laughs> it's so obvious. I'm just telling you, man. Um, 
Living in unforgiveness will destroy your life. Forgiving like Christ forgave you will set you free, man. Verse 14. Above all, clothe yourself, this is what other people see in us, with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts for as members of one body you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Loving and forgiving are probably the greatest tests of whether or not our identity is really in Jesus. Last test question to determine if we are living our identity in Jesus. Does my love for Jesus spill out on people around me? Verse 16. Let the message about Christ in all its richness Fill your lives. I mean, what a great picture, right? I mean, this, all this stuff with Jesus that helps me get rid of my sin, that, that helps me live for him, that gives me power to, to live with love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Be a forgiving, loving person. And I clothe myself in those things. So that's what people see when they see me. Let this message about Christ in all its fullness Fill your lives. Then teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. If the message of Christ helped you get rid of your junk and that, pass it on. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Hmm. Now, a little side note here. When the Bible, a couple different places, it says the same thing in Ephesians. Sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to God with a thankful heart. Now, a lot of people try to explain those verses as a list of the kind of songs we're supposed to sing at church. I, I don't think it means that at all. I, I just think it means uh, when the message of Christ fills you in all its fullness, man, it puts a song in your heart, right? I mean, man, you want to you wanna sing, <laughs> you ever feel like just singing for Jesus? A minute ago when we were singing that, I speak Jesus song, man, and it just does something in you. Why? Because when the fullness of Christ, I mean, it just, you, you want to sing. Uh, do y'all agree with this? Music is powerful. Someone said, I don't know who said this, somebody said, one, some philosopher said, um, if you want to change a culture, culture, you write their laws, let me write their songs. Pretty big. Music is powerful. Music is the language of the heart. That's why you can hear a song that you hadn't heard for 30 years. And when you hear it, it'll take you right back to that moment, right? You can almost smell the things that were going on there. Wow. Now remember, this, songs, hymns, spiritual songs, is in response to the richness of Christ in our lives. The music in our hearts that we sing should reflect that. Now, I'm not a only listen to Christian music person. I love all kinds of music, especially like classic rock. Aerosmith. But, now listen to me. The music we listen to, the music we sing, should reflect who we belong to. Music is the language of the heart, so the music we listen to says a lot about our identity. If songs about Jesus, listen, if you listen, say amen. amen. If songs about Jesus isn't, the majority of the music we listen to, that says a lot about who we are. I have a, a friend of mine who had an affair. It's been a while back. And as part of his healing, God saved his marriage. As part of his healing, he only listened to Christian music for an entire year. He said, it changed my life. I'm not a only listen to Christian music. I'm just saying... 
if a big part of it isn't Jesus music, something's wrong. You know, for, for decades, in my Christian walk, for decades, we didn't have a lot of great Christian music. We had the Gaithers. We had the Gaithers. And then there was the Gaithers. But that's not true now. We have so much incredible, you know that song we sang to open up, God is on the move. Jason Wilson wrote that song. I'm telling you what, man, if we didn't do anything but sing Jason Wilson songs, we'd be singing great music all the time. There's so much incredible music. We should list it. All right, Colossians 3, 16. Let, let's read that again. Uh, Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to God with a thankful heart. Now Paul wraps all this up in one sentence. And whatever you do or say, do as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Wow. What a great model for our life. Question. Would people think about you? That you, your identity is a child of God and you represent him. By the way we talk, by the way we behave, by the way we respond when we're hurt or angry, by the way we respond to other people when they are hurt or angry at us. How'd you do? On the identity test. Maybe you're thinking, you know what? I did all right. I give myself B plus. Maybe you're thinking, uh, you know what? I, I'm not perfect at all that stuff, but it really is how I try to live. But this really did kind of help me get a handle on claiming that identity that I have in Jesus. Maybe you're thinking, I didn't do that well on this test. Hey, I have some good news for you. Jesus is far more interested in changing you than he is condemning you. Jesus doesn't give us an F. He doesn't fail us. He just says, stay after school. I'm going to teach you something. Will you trust him to give you all you need to be all he wants you to be? Let's pray. Father... Right now, can you just help us all just ask ourselves a question? Just do a little introspection here that based on everything we've heard today, what do we need to change so that our identity is in you? Not what we have, not what we do, not what's been done to us. God, right now, can you help us, God, please, to clothe ourselves in you so that when people see us, they see you. God, teach us to live that way. Help us, God, to claim our identity that we are your child. Help us to live that way. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's stand and worship.
Nobody loves you like Jesus. He's with you. He's for you. God bless you. We hope you have a great week.